guys, it's Libby, and welcome back to your regularly scheduled booktube programming. Um, I am super excited about this one, guys. This video is going to be my TBR for the 1900 to 1950 readathon, which is being hosted by Katie from Books and Things throughout the month of May. I am so excited about this because a lot of my truly favorite books uh, including plays, were written in this time period. So um, I, I am making a TBR. This is going to be a TBR full of things that I haven't read, but I simply couldn't resist that I'm also going to be giving you some recommendations for other things that I absolutely adore that were also published in this time period. And if I finish off my TBR, I might, you know, go dip into these for some enjoyable rereads. So obviously this is about reading books that were written between the years 1900 and 1950. There are some further challenges, which I believe are optional, but I, of course, am doing them all. Um, and they are uh, read a book uh, from the country you're from, and then also from a country that you are not from, uh, read a genre classic, um, read something that isn't a novel, and then read something uh, exploring World War I or II, uh, however loosely that may be. And then bonus challenges for the hardcore folks, read something from each decade. So I will go through my TBR in uh, order of which things were published in, um, although I'm not positive that I will read them in this order, because a lot of them are like varying lengths, and I think one of them I might audiobook, so we'll just sort of see how my schedule goes. So the first thing from the aughts um, is The Playboy of the Western World by John Millington Singh. Um, he is an Irish playwright, and this is part of the Irish, is it the Irish Renaissance or the Irish Revivalist Movement? Whichever one we call it, uh, my cat has found a stick, uh, which was going on at the tail end of the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, uh, sort of a renaissance of Irish, mostly playwriting, but you also get, you know, poetry and some other genres. Um, so this is from 1907. Um, it is not a novel, and it's also covering a country that I am not from. Um, and this, I don't know that much about it. Um, I knew I wanted to read some Sing, and <laughs> this is the thing that he wrote that fits in the time period that I needed. Um, and I believe it's not the saddest thing that he wrote. Uh, so we're going with it. This is about a man who um, shows up in a new town um, and tells them this story that he is a runaway um, who is fleeing the law because he has murdered his own father. And then everyone's really into this because like murderers are cool and we sort of see how that goes. I'm hoping that this play is overall happy because I'm kind of trying to alternate happy and sad because um, my next one from the 19 teens is quite sad. I'm going to read the complete poetry of Wilfred Owen, um, which was published in 1918, although written, I think, starting in 1916. Um, Wilfred Owen is from the UK, so that's another country that I'm not from. Um, and this is also not a novel. It's a collection of poetry. Um, so yeah, Wilfred Owen was a uh, soldier in World War One. He's one of the World War One poets. Um, I have read some of his poems. I actually studied him in high school, um, but I'm gonna do the whole thing. I don't know. This seems like a, a work that's maybe better to spread out across the whole month, even though it's extremely short, um, just because some of it's a lot. Um, so. Yeah, moving on to something less miserable. Uh, Glimpses of the Moon by Edith Wharton. Um, this is the work from the country that I am from. It is from the good old US of A. Um, this was published in 1922. Again, I knew I wanted to read something by Edith Wharton and I was looking for something in the 1920s and this is what she's published in the 1920s. So this actually is a novel. Is this my, no, I've got, I've got two novels out of five works. Um, so this is my first novel. Um, this is, I believe, a comedy of manners. Um, it's about two people. Edith Wharton's works are largely set in New York. I think this one hops around a little bit in like um, down in upstate New York and also maybe a bit of New England. Um, so we've got two young people who um, are very well connected but not particularly rich themselves. So they concoct a plan to get married because everyone is really nice to newlyweds. So they will be able to spend a year like sponging off of other people and just living in their houses so they don't have to <laughs> pay for their own apartment. Um, uh, and of course, if either the marriage is going to end after one year, they're going to get divorced. And if either of them meets somebody else that they want to marry, then they can just 
uh, leave. I foresee absolutely no problems to this plan. No one will find out that they are schemers. Neither of them will accidentally fall in love with each other. Everything's gonna go nice and easy, I'm sure. Okay, that was a happy, so now back to the sad. Uh, my pick for the 1930s is Annihilation of Caste by B.R. Ambedkar. This is a um, speech, so another non-novel, um, which is a work of political philosophy, and I feel like for the 1930s, you gotta do political philosophy. Um, so this edition actually has uh, an introduction which is over 100 pages by Arundhati Roy, um, the modern novelist and essayist. So I'm kind of planning to read the introductory material this month um, to, you know, give me a little bit more time um, uh, to get through all the things I want to get through in May, and then I'm just gonna read the speech in May. Okay, and then ending on an up note, um, I've got The Ghost and Mrs. Muir by Josephine Leslie, who was writing as R.A. Dick. Um, so I think I've seen um, modern editions with both author names. Um, so uh, this was published in 1945, and it is a genre novel. It's meeting the genre challenge, because this is a gothic romance. Um, I believe pretty heavy on the gothic. Um, if you are familiar with this, you're probably familiar with the film and not the novel. Um, so this was turned into a film, I believe, quite soon after it was published, like in the mid to late 40s, um, starring Gene Tierney and Rex Harrison. Uh, so this is about a woman. Um, she's a widow. She's got a couple of children. Um, and she's currently living with her in-laws, her dead husband's family, um, but she wants to like strike out and be independent. So she um, uses the money that she's saved and goes and buys a cottage, um, which is cheap because nobody else wants it because it is haunted by a ghost. Um, uh, shenanigans ensue. So those are my picks for this readathon. If you are interested in participating and would like uh, some suggestions, here are mine. Um, there are so many <laughs> books plays, mostly books and mostly novels and plays, uh, maybe I've got something else in here, um, uh, from this time period. I think like part of that is maybe because the early 20th century, the early to mid 20th century is when you start to get like a proper queer literature culture for the first time since Plato. Um, so like that's very meaningful to me. I get very excited about that. A lot of these recommendations are gonna be pretty gay. That's what you guys are here for, right? Um, so we're actually starting off with some straight stuff. Um, so uh, I'd like to recommend two plays by George Bernard Shaw, and I will give you information relevant to the challenges in case you're trying to fulfill a challenge. Um, so George Bernard Shaw was born in Ireland, but did most of his writing while he lived in England. So I feel like you can kind of put him in whatever country you need him to be in. Um, first recommendation is his 1905 play, Major Barbara. This I think is my favorite Shaw play of the maybe dozen or so that I've read. Um, I have described it as a perfect play. It is funny and smart and moving. Um, this is also like fairly philosophical. It's exploring ethics um, and it's about a sort of conflict between a father and daughter. Um, the daughter is a, the major, Major Barbara. She's not a major in the army. She's a major in the Salvation Army. Um, so she's like part of a Christian movement, which is mainly focused on helping the poor, but part of helping the poor involves getting them to convert to Christianity. Um, and uh, uh, a not Church of England Christianity. And then her father is um, presumably an atheist. At some point someone asked him what his religion is and he says, uh, my religion is I am a millionaire um, who uh, manufactures weapons. He has made his money through um, being a weapon manufacturer. Um, and uh, he offers to give money to his daughter's uh, cause, but she doesn't want his tainted money, which is used from like killing people. And so it's just about their conflict and it is utterly fascinating. Um, also their family, like um, Barbara's mother and siblings provide some comic relief as well as her fiance. Um, then the other George Bernard Shaw is Pygmalion. Now this is not like one of my absolute favorites, but I do consider this to be a must read for like the culture. Um, so Pygmalion was published in 1913, or the, the play premiered in 1913. Um, a note about Shaw, um, 
Unlike most earlier playwrights, Shaw intended for his plays to be read as well as performed. So if you haven't read plays before, Shaw is a pretty good place to get started. And Pygmalion, quite notably, actually has like a pretty lengthy epilogue, um, which is only in the published version. Like, it's not like someone comes out and reads the epilogue um, after the play. So there's like some stuff that you only get if you read it as opposed to watch it. Um, so uh, Pygmalion, if you are familiar with this story, it's possibly from the Greek myth about a sculptor who sculpts a beautiful woman and then falls in love with a statue and then she magically turns into a real woman, um, or the musical My Fair Lady. Um, so uh, if you are familiar with either of those, um, or if you are familiar with My Fair Lady, um, it's about a, a sort of linguistics He's not a professor, I don't think he teaches, but a linguistics nerd um, who studies um, speech, uh, dialect, and idiolect. Um, and he makes a bet with a friend um, that he can take a cockney flower girl and pass her off as aristocracy in front of, you know, all of the fancy people of London um, in a mere six weeks or something through his um, elocution lessons. Um, so, uh, uh, if you have only seen the musical My Fair Lady, I think you absolutely need to read Pygmalion because the ending is different and Shaw was actually alive during um, the when they were writing My Fair Lady and he fought really hard to keep his original ending and they changed it and he was pretty pissed. Um, so I think as a favor to Shaw, you absolutely have to read his original ending, which I think is a lot better. Um, I've got two E.M. Forster recommendations. Um, I do have, there are more E.M. Forster books that I've read and liked, but I'm trying to keep this list to the, the absolute creme de la creme. Um, so I'm going to recommend Morris and Howard's End. Um, let's start with Morris, because it's the one that I read first. Um, so this, uh, you might actually not see on lists if you're like on Goodreads looking for things published between 1900 and 1950, because this is actually published in 1971, but you can still read it for the readathon because it was written uh, from 1913 to 1914. Um, this is a gay buildings roman, um, and Forster waited until he was dead to have to allow this to be published because he didn't want to out himself. Um, I have given this book its own review. It's just, it's just so good. It's an absolute beautiful gem. Uh, okay, moving on. <laughs> You absolutely have to read Morris, that's not negotiable. Um, uh, then I'd also talk, like to talk about Howard's End by Ian e. Forster, which I read very recently. Um, so you can find me talking about it in a recent wrap up that I did. Um, yeah, this is, uh, was published in, oh gosh, what was it? Uh, I'm gonna guess and say 1910. Oh my God, 1910, I got it right. Um, yeah, so this was published in 1910. Um, Forster is English. So these count, you know, for either challenge one or two, depending on what country you're from. Um, so this is about um, three different families um, in Edwardian England um, and sort of like their relationship to each other and their relationship to money is very interesting if you're interested in socioeconomics of uh, this time period. Next, I would like to recommend uh, another Edith Wharton. Um, this is The Custom of the Country, which was published in 1913. I feel like Custom of the Country hasn't like broken as big, you know, outside of the literary sphere into like the pop sphere because it hasn't had a film adaptation like um, Age of Innocence or House of Mirth has. Um, but in the literary scene, this is considered possibly her best novel. Um, so it's about um, Undine Sprague, quite a name, who is from Apex City, which is somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, and she and her parents move to New York City um, so that she can uh, mingle amongst the fine people there. Um, and she's pretty insufferable. Um, and for the first couple chapters, I can understand people having a hard time. I actually had a pretty hard time getting through the first couple chapters. Full disclosure, I was listening to this as an audiobook when I was um, on a road trip and I wasn't driving, so I a little bit fell asleep in chapters two and three, which meant I was really confused. I had a really hard time keeping track of all the characters at the beginning. Um, so you know, this might just be my experience, but if I was gonna read this again, I would maybe like, make a little list of who the characters are and what their relationships are to each other because there's like siblings, 
there's people who are married, there's people who, uh, you know, married and love each other, married and don't love each other, engaged to each other, people are rumored they are engaged to each other, so it's a whole mess. Um, and also Undine uh, is, is pretty like thoughtless for other people and is really just interested in getting what she wants. Um, and so I recommend, I would say get through Paul's birthday party. Um, if you get to that point in the book and you're still not having a good time, then like maybe this book isn't for you and you should DNF. But uh, uh, you know, for me, that's when this book really started to pick up. And seeing the adventures that Undine <laughs> gets herself into uh, was really rewarding in the end. And uh, regular viewers of mine definitely saw this coming. It is 1938's Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Um, this is also gothic romance if you need something to cover a genre thing. Um, yeah, this is my favorite book of all time. <laughs> um, it's about a woman um, who is, uh, you know, poor and an orphan. She marries a uh, much older, much richer man and goes back to his house, which is maybe kind of haunted by his first wife, who really seems like he's still in love with. And she's just got a lot to live up to and she can't do it. And the writing is pretty fascinating because we spend so much of the book inside the mind of the protagonist like her one might say fantasies but that normally has a positive context her like paranoid daydreams about what other people are thinking about her um, when of course most people are not thinking about her at all because they're thinking about themselves um uh uh so good if you've read jane eyre this is really interesting to juxtapose to jane eyre highly recommend so much then, uh, actually moving backwards in time to 1932, um, I'd like to recommend something written by a friend of Daphne du Maurier, uh, and that is Noel Coward, the playwright. He is probably, his most famous work is probably Private Lives, but I would like to recommend Design for Living, um, which is a play in three acts, which is a uh, very like bohemian it probably would have been called at the time uh, i would call it very queer um so coward was gay um this was not a big secret at the time um and this play is about a set of three you know bohemian people gilda leo and otto now, because it's coming out in the 1930s, this is obviously all deep in the subtext, but modern productions normally present it as, um, at the beginning, uh, Gilda and one of the guys are in a relationship and just kind of cheating with the other guy. Um, then that flips, um, and then in the second act, and then in the third act, um, Gilda is off on her own, and it's the two guys who are together. And the audience is left feeling that like really all three of these people belong together and the, you know, strictures of like, oh gosh, the light came on, of, um, you know, a two person heteronormative couple is really just ruining these people's lives and they would be much happier together. So this is like a very early representation of like queer polyamory um, on the English stage and it's a, really a delight to read. Uh, and then last one from the 1940s, uh, Noel Coward is English. Uh, this is a, another, uh, this author, it's C.S. Lewis, I'll tell you. Um, so C.S. Lewis was born in Belfast, but did most of his writing in England. Belfast is in Northern Ireland. I don't know how we're counting this, guys. <laughs> Not a part of that. Um, so I am today talking about his 1942 novel? Uh, the screw tape letters. Um, these are amazing. Um, so <laughs> I'm definitely not picking up what C.S. Lewis is putting down. I interpret these in a very different manner than he did. C.S. Lewis was like, in case you don't know, a hardcore Christian. Um, and this, these are letters written by screw tape, who is a pretty high ranking devil to his nephew, who is a lower ranking devil, who is um, asking for advice on how to tempt his charge. So in this world, um, humans, I have to pet the cat, um, humans get like an angel and a devil on each shoulder. Um, uh, uh, Screwtape's nephew is the devil on this one guy's shoulder and he's asking for advice because if this nephew can get his human charge into hell, that's like points for him. Um, 
And so it's quite like a coy and fun. Screw tape is very charming, um, but also, you know, a devil, so like properly evil. Um, this also like very obliquely references the fact that World War II is going on. So if you like really need something to fill the, uh, talks about one of the World Wars challenge and you don't really want to read something about a war, this has about like five sentences which vaguely reference the war. So I think it's like just enough to tick the box. And I think it's an absolutely brilliant read. And last time I checked, I don't know how legal this is, but I am not part of YouTube's legal team, so this is not my problem. Um, there was a uh, version of the audiobook available on YouTube read by John Cleese, uh, which I highly recommend. It's also a very short work. Um, so the audiobook's is something like three hours. So really nice to get through in a readathon, take it off the list, feel accomplished. Um, I told Nova that if she was going to talk so much during my video, she was required to make an appearance. So here is the kitty. She really does not like to be held, as you can see. She's going to... <laughs> Did she destroy my shirt? No, we're good. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, hopefully just I will see you guys later. Um, Nova may need to butt her head in in future. Parenting.